welcome, 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 welcome to our uh, inspirational, today's edition of Inspirational Wednesdays. My name is Pastor Al Kennedy. It's my pleasure, it's my honor, it's my privilege to be here with you, to facilitate this call, to be here with you, to... Uh, to be here with you to worship God in, in in spirit and in truth. It is our hope. It is our prayer. It is our uh, wish that God would be right here with us, that God would be right in this place, that God would do what only he could do, and he would allow us to experience the fullness of his grace and his mercy as we come together for uh, prayer, praise, and devotion. I believe that when we pray, when we, when we pray, God responds immediately. When we pray, we get his attention. When we pray, uh, God is on the line. And when, and when we pray, and we especially pray earnestly. God takes our prayer requests. He takes our prayer concerns and he works on that thing. He molds that thing. He shapes that thing. He builds that thing. He makes it so that that which once troubles us is the very thing that propels us. That our tests become our testimonies and our messes become our messages. I don't know what you're going through. Amen. I'm not clairvoyant. <clears throat> nor do I have a little birdie telling me what you're dealing with. However, I believe that if you have just enough faith to muster the words, enough faith to put your thoughts together into a request, God has the ability to overcome whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is that you're up against, all right? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to start our prayer conference call this morning. We're going to have our opening word of prayer. And then after that, we're going to move forward with our devotional. We have a good devotional this morning. Amen. Praise God. And then after that, we'll dedicate the rest of the time to receiving your prayer requests, your praise reports, your prayers, your words of, encur of encouragement, your testimonies, and your witnesses. So without further ado, let's jump right in and let's get right in it. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we come to you right now. Thank you, God, for God just being God, just being amazing, just being wonderful, just being awesome, just being on point, just being so loving and so kind, just being so graceful and so merciful, just being dependable and reliable, just being patient and long-suffering, just for being kind and generous, just for being forgiving, just for being selfless, God, God, just for being an amazing God, we come to you right now in thanks, praise, and honor, God. God, you mean so much to us, God, that if you were to leave us, we don't know where we would go or what we would do. So, God, to show you how much we depend upon, upon you, to show you how much we need you, God, right now we're coming to you, God, to submit our prayers to you, submit our problems, to submit our predicaments, to submit our trials and tribulations to you, to submit our worries and our issues, God, to submit those things that are stressing us out, God, and beating us down, God, and worrying us to death. God, we bring it all to you and we leave it right here at your feet. Knowing God by faith that you, God, will take this thing, you, God, will work that thing out, and you, God, will present it back to us in a form of a blessing that so much so that we won't even be able to recognize that it was a problem to begin with. Father God, thank you for this chance to come together and to worship you through the ministry of prayer. Thank you for this chance to be able to lift up those people who are, aren't able to lift up themselves or are going through something. Father God, we pray that right now you will have your way in this space, in this place. Allow your Holy Spirit to rest, rule, and abide on this call. It's in your Son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Our scriptorial focus for our devotional this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter. We're going to look at verses 47 through 52. So that's Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 52. The New Living Translation of our scripture reads as follows. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down, and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. 
that that is the way it will be at the end of the world the angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth do you understand all these things yes they said we do then he added every teacher of, of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. Thus far, the word of God. Amen. The title of our devotional this morning is Cracking the Parable Code, Part 5. Cracking the Parable Code, Part 5. In our scripture this week, Jesus tells two parables. The first parable involves fishermen casting a great big net into the water that catch as many fish as they can, while the second parable involves a homeowner adding new priceless gems to his already impressive jewelry collection. In both parables, um, the Lord conveys something important to us. And as with the other parables that we have examined thus far here at Inspirational Wednesdays, it's imperative that we understand what it is, what is that truth or truths. Uh, what I'm sorry, it is imperative that we understand what it is that these that truth or truths uh, are trying to tell us, so that we can be the best disciples and stewards that we can be for our heavenly Father. In th this first paragraph, Jesus analogizes the kingdom of heaven to a fishing net. He informs us that this net was thrown out into the water. Presumably, presumably, this body of water is a large lake, sea, or even the ocean. We can also reason, reasonably presume, presume that the fishing net in question is an extremely large one. The reason why we can make such a presumption is because Jesus informs us that the fishermen used this fishing net to catch every kind of fish there was within that body of water. To accomplish this feat, the fishing net itself had to be extremely large. But more, important than, more importantly than that, there is a bigger point that our God has dropped into our laps this morning. He is explicitly informing us that one of the kingdom's explicit purposes is to reach everyone. It doesn't matter who we encounter as representatives of God's kingdom. Our duty is to share the gospel with each and every person we encounter. It doesn't matter if the people we encounter are rich or poor. Share the gospel with them. It doesn't matter if the people we meet are young or old. Share the gospel with them. It doesn't matter if the people we encounter are educated or not. Share the gospel with them. It doesn't matter if the people we meet look like us or are from the same community that we are. Share the gospel with them. There are no specific prerequisites that a person must meet before they can be introduced to God in his kingdom. If they are alive, have warm blood coursing through their veins, and they are drawing air in and out of their lungs, then we must take advantage of every opportunity to share the gospel with them. Jesus' fishing net parable informs us that at some point, the fishermen, the fishermen I'm sorry, separate the good fish from the bad fish. This separation process doesn't occur until after the net has been withdrawn from the water and brought back to the shore. Only then does the fisherman begin distinguishing the good fish worth keeping from the bad fish that must be thrown away. It's clear that when Jesus speaks about the fishermen separating the good fish from the bad fish, he's speaking about a time when the faithful believers in God will be called home to heaven while the evildoers and non-believers will be sent to hell. This is a favorite topic of Jesus throughout the Gospel of Matthew. What I find interesting about this part of the parable is that Jesus decides to explain the significance of this separation process. He goes into detail elaborating exactly how God, his father, will conduct this process. Now get this, nowhere else in any of these parables does Jesus provide the general audience, the general public, an explanation of what his parables mean. But in this particular instance, particular instance, Jesus is unwilling to take a chance on whether or not his audience understands exactly what he means when he shares this part of his fishing net parable with them. He's unwilling 
to take the risk that someone may not grasp the underlying meaning, excuse me, and purpose of this separation process. So Jesus proceeds to explain to his audience exactly what he means. This separation promise, I mean, I'm sorry, this separation process is a promise to the citizens of God's kingdom that the day is coming in the near future when he will separate us from those that mean the kingdom no good. Every user, every abuser, every liar, every thief, every murderer, every con artist, car artist, every heartbreaker, every manipulator, every perpetrator of evil will be separated away from us. They will be gathered together and sent to hell where they will suffer for all eternity. I know we want to celebrate that truth right now, but before, but before we do, we miss something important. Did we notice in Jesus' parable that evildoers not only have access to the kingdom along with us faithful believers, but they are allowed also to stay there for a time. That's right. God permits them to dwell within the kingdom. He doesn't withhold the kingdom from them, nor does he forbid them from entering and, and experiencing it. Now, I know that someone may be saying to yourself, why, God, if you know that these persons are evildoers, why would you let them have access to your kingdom? The Lord's answer is really a simple one. He allows evildoers to have access to the kingdom for a time so that these persons may have the opportunity to be transformed. It is God's express will that all should be saved. He has declared that none should be lost. In order for all persons to be saved, they must be exposed to the gospel. They must be given the opportunity to hear about how our Heavenly Father demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, he sent his only begotten son, Christ Jesus, to die for us. They must be exposed to the truth that whosoever believes in his, his or her heart and confesses with his or her mouth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, that person will be saved. None of this can happen if evildoers are always kept out of the kingdom. This fact should change our perspectives drastically. Many of us have been complaining to the Lord about why he hasn't yet removed those persons from our lives that have caused us trouble and have deposited negativity into our lives. We have assumed that God has fallen short on the job, that he has shirked his godly responsibilities. What we should realize this morning is that our Heavenly Father hasn't yet wiped those evildoers from the face of the earth because he's waiting on us to present the gospel to these persons. We must never forget that the kingdom of heaven isn't merely just a place where we will eventually inhabit forever, nor is it merely a thing that exists on that side of the great chasm. The kingdom of heaven exists within, it, within every believer. We carry it around with us every day of our lives. And what's more, we are the kingdom of heaven. We don't simply carry it around with it. We are it. This is why God allows evildoers to continue hanging around in our lives. He's expecting us, the kingdom bearers, to expose the kingdom of heaven to these persons so that they may have an opportunity, opportunity to no longer be enemies of the kingdom, but to become kingdom citizens themselves. Today, when we go to work, stop seeing our co-workers as that bunch of hellions over there. Instead, see them as a field ripe with crop that has yet to be harvested. Go share the gospel with them and see how they respond positively and affirmatively to it. As stated at the beginning of this devotional, there are two separate parables in this scripture. From the way they are presented, it's clear that God, that Jesus, yes, God, told both parables in the same instance. This second parable is interesting because it builds on God's truth about evildoers. In the second parable, Jesus analogizes the spiritual conversion of every teacher of religious law into a Christian disciple for the Lord to a homeowner adding new priceless gems to an already impressive jewelry collection. Now, I know someone may be asking yourself, how, Pastor Al, how does a transformation of a teacher of religious law connect to God's revelation that he permits evildoers to reside within, within the kingdom of heaven for a time? I'm glad you asked. If we will recall, Matthew repeatedly records Jesus referring to the teachers of religious laws, religious law, as quote unquote broods of vipers. 
This gospel also records Jesus identifying these religious leaders as quote-unquote wolves in sheep's clothing. In other gospels, these same religious leaders are described as quote-unquote hired hands that abandon the sheep when the sheep are threatened with danger. They are also identified as quote-unquote thieves and robbers that sneak into the sheep pen presumptively to steal God's sheep. Constantly, the teachers of religious law, whether they are Pharisees, Sadducees, or scribes, are presented as the epitome of evil. And what makes them so evil is that these leaders pretend to be righteous and faithful followers of God, but are actually perverting God's law for their own personal benefit. We can also be fairly confident that within the audience of listeners are Pharisees, uh, Sadducees, and scribes. All the Gospels make it clear that it wasn't just the large crowds of people that followed Jesus wherever he went. Uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes also followed him. But unlike the crowd, these religious leaders followed Jesus in order to contradict him and harass him. They sought to diminish any influence he had with the crowd by qu questioning him publicly. So when Jesus includes the second parable with the first parable, he's intentionally pointing out who the evildoers are. But he's also informing these religious leaders that the Lord, his father, is giving them a chance to change. They don't have to be outsiders to the kingdom of God any longer. Instead, they could be kingdom citizens just like everyone else. And Jesus wanted these leaders to know that their transformation and inclusion within God's kingdom was invaluable. Because these leaders have received such rigorous religious training, they could take the kingdom much further when they actually began living their lives by faith. So where does all this leave us this morning? There are several things we must walk away with. First, our God, our job as kingdom citizens is to share the gospel with everyone regardless of who they are. Second, evildoers as well as kingdom citizens will inhabit the kingdom of heaven for a while. There. Third, as kingdom citizens, we must stop tripping out that there are evildoers within the kingdom. God wants uh, to use us kingdom citizens to provide these persons with the opportunity to change for the Lord. And fourth, those persons that know God but are perverting his truths for their own benefit have been offered an invitation to come to him, to be transformed spiritually, and to gain true access to the kingdom of heaven. There, we have it, a devotion of inspiration to guide us as we move throughout the next seven days. Let's be those Christian uh, disciples, those Christian citizens, those Christian stewards that engage in ministry, uh, the ministry of kindness, the ministry of giving, the ministry of, uh, of sharing in such a way that what happened, God sees us as fishermen who are collecting fish for him for a harvest for him to reap amen amen let's do this <laughs> sorry let's uh have our uh word of prayer over our uh devotional before we transition into the prayer section of our call amen um uh, here let us go to god in prayer dear father god creator of the heavens and the earth god we come to you right now thank you god for this devotional god more importantly thank you for the truths that you share with us in the devotional god we can't tell you how many times persons have done something wrong done something evil done something sinful towards us and our first response is god slay them god knock them down god deal with them god punish them god curse them god get them away from us <coughs> thank you for helping us understand that god these, you've allowed these persons to come into our presence, not because you are wanting them to torment us, but you're hoping that by association comes assimilation, that by associating with us that our faith would rub off on them, that our hope and our trust and our belief in you would rub off on them and that they would no longer be enemies <coughs> and evildoers but they would become kingdom citizens, persons that serve you, persons that love you, persons that want to bring you glory, honor, and praise. Father God, thank you for helping us realize that the kingdom is, a, is, a, is about us as much as it is about them. And for helping us realize that God, we take it wherever we go because we are it. 
Now, Father God, as we go into this day, help us to see the things that we've been seeing differently. Help us to understand that you have strategically planted us at our jobs, in our communities, in our churches, in our gyms, in our uh, civic organizations, in our community organizations to make the difference for you. You strategically planted us there so that someone may hear the good news about the sacrifice that your son made for us, that someone may hear just how much you love us, and they may accept this free gift of salvation and begin living a life that takes them to eternity with you. Father God, it's time now for us to transition from our devotional section of our prayer conference call to the prayer section of our conference call. It's our prayer, it's our hope, it's our wish. That God, you are already into the prayer section of our conference call and that God, you have saturated this space so that persons find it easy to raise their prayer requests, their praise reports, their prayers, their words of encouragement, their witnesses and their testimonies. We pray right now, God, that you sympathize and empathize our hearts so that as persons are raising their prayer requests, that God, you would uh, uh, enable uh, us uh, to understand exactly what the what the person is going through and be able to join them where they are and lifting up the prayers that they ha- that they are that they are lifting up. Now, Father God, we pray that you be glorified in this space, this place, and this time. God, have your way with us. It's in your Son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. Praise God. It's time for us to get right into the prayer section of our call. It's time for us to lift up our prayer concerns, our praise, prayer reports, praise reports, I'm sorry, our, our words of cursor, our testimonies, our witnesses. I believe that in the last seven days, God has done us a, a, some mighty, mighty things in our lives and that He there's something that uh, uh, he wants us to share a praise report about as well as he's made us aware of some things that people are going through and even we may be going through something that he wants us not to sit on it, not to bury and not to think that it's something so unique to us that if other people heard it, that they will look at us with, with, with disdain or with shame, but rather to trust and believe the word of God where it says where two or more are gathered in his presence, there shall he also be. So let's do this. I'm here. You're here. We got the two. God is here. He brings his son. He brings his Holy Spirit. All we have to do is trust him and believe and and tender to him that which we cannot handle on our own. So we're going to open up the floor. Give us your name, where you're calling from, and, uh, and what it is that we can pray with you and for you about, and we'll go from there. Good morning, family. It's Nancy from Jersey. Good morning, love. How you doing? 